Thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to open this conference. Um, Spinoza famously said that excellent things are rare, and then the implication of that is that rare things are difficult to pursue. Um, and in important ways, cognitive science is both excellent and difficult to pursue. You have to get relative expertise in at least some of the home discipline, good familiarity with all of them, and then you have to do something above and beyond that. I proposed ideas around synoptic integration. Other people have proposed other frameworks. And I think this is what is truly wonderful about cognitive science, uh, that difficulty and its accompanying excellence. I get regular reports from my colleagues that the CogSci students are some of the best students in the psychology classes, the computer science classes, the philosophy classes, the linguistics class. And I do not think that is happenstance. I think that's for the reason that we are doing something that is sorely needed today in the knowledge economy, which is an attempt to integrate across discipline, attempt to bridge between levels of explanation, and an attempt to try and afford the rich theoretical activity that must accompany the empirical work of any good science. I do think that cognitive science in this way represents a real important way in which we can deal with the replication crisis in the social sciences. Yes, we have to improve our stats and our lab policies and our publishing policies, but many people have argued, and I agree with this, that we need people who are working at deriving theoretical frameworks that push on having all of our theoretical constructs consistent and conciliate towards each other and reveal vagueness, inconsistency, and incoherence. And that's what the COGSI program is doing. And therefore, I think it's really important that there be these kinds of conferences. This is where you are already, all of you, starting to excel in that task I just specified. That task of the kind of unique and important theorization that is crucial within the cognitive sciences as cognitive science and is also crucial to the social sciences as a whole. And so I'm here to encourage you and also to celebrate how you are undertaking, I think, this vitally important, excellent, but rare thing you're doing here today. So I thank you. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing some of the talks. Unfortunately, I can't stay very long, but I hope that this promises, this day fulfills its equally clear promise of being an excellent forum for people to start exploring the kind of theoretical argumentation and empirical research that is so needed today. There we go. Okay. The missing puzzle piece. How panpsychism solves cognitive science's naturalistic imperative. So what is consciousness? Right now, you're listening to my voice, looking at the image on the screen, and feeling your seat beneath you. And there's a subjective sense of what this experience feels like. Anytime we experience something, it feels a certain way to us. Philosophers use words like qualia, what it's likeness, and phenomenal consciousness to refer to the subjective experience of what things feel like. To understand this, we can use the analogy of an internal movie theater. We have sight, sound, touch, and all of our other senses giving us perceptual feedback about our world, and these perceptions appear to us on our internal movie screen. Our consciousness is the thing that is experiencing this inner movie theater, or this inner movie. The movie theater analogy might not be how consciousness actually works, but it is how consciousness feels. When we perceive something, it feels a certain way to perceive that thing. Current science can explain the features of this inner movie quite well. For example, we know that the visual cortex is needed for visual perception, the auditory cortex is needed for auditory perception, and so on. These explanations focus on the physical mechanisms involved in perception, but fall short 
on answering how and why there's a subjective sense of experiencing the internal movie. Take the experience of seeing red, for example. This purple circle represents our scientific understanding of the world. And within this, we can break down the mechanisms of seeing red, such as light existing in a certain wavelength and the way the visual cortex is activated. This breakdown of physical mechanisms does a great job at explaining the input and output of the brain. But there's still this mental experience of seeing red, the thing that philosophers call phenomenal consciousness that the physical mechanisms have yet, uh, has so far failed to explain. In his famous paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? American philosopher Thomas Nagel used the example of being a bat to illustrate this very point. He said that even if we had a complete scientific account of echolocation, we would not know what it feels like to echolocate. The gap here between the physical mechanisms of consciousness and phenomenal conscious experience is what philosopher David Chalmers has coined the hard problem. Chalmers makes the distinction between what he calls the easy problems of consciousness and the hard problem of consciousness. The easy problems are explaining the physical system involved in conscious experience, such as how the visual cortex is activated when you see the color red. We can think of the easy problems like explaining the features of our inner movie theater. These easy problems are inside of this purple bubble of scientific explanation. This is contrasted with the hard problem of consciousness, explaining why there's a subjective experience of redness at all. We can think of this like explaining the experiencer sitting inside the internal movie theater. And this experience of redness sits outside of our purple bubble of scientific understanding. Chalmers hammers his point home by claiming that even if science had a complete account of the brain and all of its physical mechanisms, in other words, if all of the easy problems were solved, the hard problem would still persist. This is because the easy problems concern structures and functions, whereas the hard problem concerns something which might turn out to be irreducible. We all have a subjective sense of ourselves experiencing our lives. And this is the undeniable datum of human conscious experience. Science may yet find a way to solve the hard problem, but it may be that scientific explanations of our inner movie theater, of hearing, touch, or seeing red, may never be enough to explain the experience of the inner movie. For this reason, solving the hard problem has been called the final frontier for science. And it's for cognitive science to play an important role in solving the hard problem. Cognitive science involves many disciplines, and the project of cognitive science, as stated by University of Toronto's very own Professor Verbeke, is the naturalistic imperative, which roughly states that the goal of cognitive science is to comprehensively understand the mind, and by doing so, put human experience back within the scientific worldview. Consciousness is an important part of the mind, and an account of the mind that does not account for consciousness is therefore incomplete. Therefore, it becomes the task of cognitive science to explain phenomenal consciousness in a naturalistic way, to bridge the gap between our scientific understanding of the physical mechanisms of the natural world and our undeniable datum of conscious experience. Now that we understand what the hard problem is, let's take a look at two popular metaphysical views and their solutions to the hard problem. First, we have reductive physicalism which for the sake of this presentation, I will just refer to as physicalism. This view is favored by scientists around the world. And physicalism states that there is only one type of stuff in the world, and that this stuff is physical. Nothing exists above this level, and everything in our universe can be reduced to physical happenings. Going back to our diagram, this view does a great job at explaining the physical processes of seeing red, also known as the easy problems within our purple bubble, but doesn't really have anything to say about phenomenal consciousness. The inability of physical science to speak on phenomenal consciousness is what has given rise to the hard problem. Now that we understand the view of physicalism, let's see how they can respond to the hard problem. You might think that a physicalist can simply say that the activity of the brain gives rise to mental experience. But this is a common misconception of the physicalist account of consciousness. To say that consciousness is caused by the physical activity of the brain 
is to say that consciousness is something other than physical. And this is not consistent with physicalism. For a physicalist, consciousness does not arise from brain states. Consciousness is brain state. What this means in practice is that to account for consciousness, physicalists are forced into the position of regarding conscious experience as an illusion created by the brain. There is no real experience of redness, just the mechanisms that produce it. This position is sometimes called illusionism, and while viable, it seems to have a deeply unsatisfying account of conscious experience. It also doesn't really seem to serve the goals of the naturalistic imperative of putting human experience back within science. Illusionism simply denies human experience outright. Okay, you might say, what if conscious experience isn't physical? What if it's just mental stuff? And this, is, this leads us to a different view, mind-body dualism. This view states that the world consists of two types of stuff, physical stuff and mental stuff each governed by their own set of rules. I have a physical body, which follows the, physical, the rules of the physical world, but I have a mental mind, which exists outside the realm of physical explanation. Dualism proposes that our physical laws of science do not pertain to mental stuff, and that's quite problematic. For that reason, this view is often written off and seen as unscientific, because if mental stuff isn't beholden to the physical world, we can never do science with mental stuff and never do science of consciousness. Not many people favor dualism today, but it's important to note that dualism is able to account for consciousness by saying that consciousness is fundamentally mental stuff. Our physical body is governed by the physical laws of the world represented by the purple bubble, and our consciousness, our experience of the inner movie is governed by a different set of rules. Uh, this is shown, this bubble supposed to be green, as shown by the green bubble. Dualists do not need to respond to the heart problem because they can account for consciousness. However, they have to concede that the laws of the physical world do not pertain to consciousness in any way. If these are the only two views, then we're forced to pick between the physicalist answer and say that consciousness is an illusion created by the brain, or the dualist answer and say that consciousness is something that we can never do science with. Neither of these views really has a satisfying account of consciousness. And importantly, neither do a great job at furthering cognitive science's naturalistic imperative of putting human experience back within science. Only now that we've examined the deep issues of physicalism and dualism, does it make sense to present what might seem like an absurd idea as an alternative. Panpsychism is the view that mental experience is a fundamental and ubiquitous part of the natural world. What this means is consciousness is neither an illusion nor some mental thing outside the natural world, but is intrinsically a part of it. In this view, human consciousness is thought to be a highly refined instance of a more universal concept. There's several different formulations of panpsychism, but I'm gonna focus on what's called reductive panpsychism, which says that the very building blocks of the universe have some amount of conscious experience, and that the experience of these micro entities combined in a reductive manner to give rise to the experience of macro entities. The notion that molecules, atoms, or subatomic particles have mental experience might sound completely absurd, but let's be clear about what we mean by mental experience. Panpsychism does not state that electrons have complex thoughts and feelings like a human does. It instead states that there is something that it is like to be an electron. The electron has an extremely primitive movie theater with no, uh, with no visuals or other human-like perceptual capabilities, but there's still something that it is like to be that electron. Now you might be thinking to yourself, we can't just say electrons are conscious. That's completely unscientific. But there's actually a precedent for science, for, in science for this type of thing. In physics, certain things such as mass are taken to be basic or fundamental. And we make fundamental laws, like the laws of gravity, to explain how these basic things work. By saying, that mass, by saying that mass is something that is basic does not mean that we cannot do science with it. It's exactly because we say that mass is basic that we can propose fundamental laws and work our way up. This happened in the 19th century when scientist James Maxwell discovered a electromagnetic phenomenon that could not be explained in terms of the existing fundamental laws. 
So he proposed electric charge as being a fundamental part of the universe and proposed fundamental laws of electromagnetism to govern how electric charge works. What panpsychism is proposing is that mental experience is another one of these fundamental things and that to understand it, we need to propose fundamental laws of consciousness. As we can see, this view fits neatly within the scientific worldview and also satisfies the inclination for reducibility. We can explain our conscious experience by saying that it comes down to the mental experience of the building blocks that we are made out of. In the same way that when two atoms combine into a molecule, the mass of the molecule is the cumulative result of the mass of the atom, panpsychism says that the consciousness of the building blocks combine into more complex forms of consciousness. To go back to our diagram, panpsychism proposes this larger purple circle representing our scientific understanding and says that it can account for both phenomenal consciousness, what things feel like, as well as functional consciousness, the input and the output of the brain. Because in panpsychism, consciousness is intrinsically a part of the physical world. However, panpsychism isn't perfect. And the serious problem that it faces is exactly how many different micro experiences combine into a single macro experience. This is known as the combination problem for panpsychism. And solving it is no easy task. But I believe that, ex that, it, that explaining how micro experience combines into macro experience is an easier task than the hard problem is, and a better solution than denying conscious experience. Despite the combination problem, panpsychism is a completely valid solution to the hard problem of consciousness. And there's even a theory in neuroscience which could, which could possibly be a fundamental law that governs consciousness. Integrated, informa integrated information theory was developed by neuroscientist Giulio Tononi and is a highly mathematical theory of consciousness. IIT links the information processing of a system to its amount of consciousness and uses the Greek letter phi to represent this. It says that a high amount of information processing, oh, that a high amount of information processing, something like the human brain has, equals a high amount of consciousness and a low amount of information processing, like what an ant has equals a low amount of consciousness. The less information processing a system has, the less consciousness it has. And this goes all the way down to the atomic and subatomic level. But importantly, the amount of consciousness never hits zero. This fits with the panpsychist view that consciousness is both a fundamental part of the universe and is everywhere. The consequences of this, however, are that complex systems that integrate information, such as the Atlantic Ocean, can be seen as conscious. This isn't to say that ocean consciousness and human consciousness feel the same. It's just to say that there is something that it is like to be an ocean. IIT is highly mathematical, and we're not sure if it's correct, but it is one potential way that accepting consciousness as a fundamental part of the natural world can allow our science of the mind to advance. If IIT is true, then panpsychism is far ahead of both physicalism and dualism in providing an account for consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness, of explaining why we have phenomenal subjective experience, is a serious problem for cognitive science. And in this presentation, I presented three options. Number one, go with the dualist position of saying that consciousness is mental stuff that we can never do science with. I think that's the worst option. Number two, go with physicalism and deny that consciousness really exists in the way that we think it does, also known as illusionism. And number three, go with the panpsychist view and say that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous part of the natural world. I argue that out of these views, panpsychism is the clear favorite. We're not forced to preserve our scientific narrative of the natural world or account for consciousness. Panpsychism can say that consciousness is both real and fits within our naturalistic view of the world. Panpsychism's most attractive feature is that it puts human consciousness back within the natural world. Our datum of conscious experience is no longer outside of the natural world, world but is instead continuous with it. If we think of consciousness as something that is fu a fundamental part of the universe, 
we can propose fundamental laws of mental experience and begin our scientific understanding of consciousness. Panpsychism provides a place for consciousness within our scientific story of the universe. I believe that panpsychism is the metaphysical machinery that cognitive science needs to account for consciousness and move towards solving its naturalistic imperative. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, while we're going to have a Q&A for Jonah, so if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand and ask away. Raise your hand. In the back. If you had more time um, for your presentation, what would you like to add? Yeah, so this this uh, presentation was based on a paper, which was much larger and covered a lot of other things. It talked about how panpsychism solves other problems. One of these is called the genetic argument for panpsychism, and it talks about how consciousness may have evolved, how if we, we stick with the physicalist account of consciousness, um, and we agree that we're conscious right now, um, and we don't think consciousness has always existed, we're faced with explaining how consciousness emerged. So basically things that are fundamentally not conscious at some point became conscious. Um, and then we'd have to explain the emergence of this, which isn't a fatal problem, but panpsychism can solve it in an arguably more satisfying way. Um, and then an another, another thing which I would have added is in IIT, there's a potential solution to the combination problem. There's a very complex formula uh, and it says that there's a maximum of integrated information. And that could explain why, you know, I'm conscious, but the atoms inside me, they have mental experience, but they don't individually experience conscious because I'm part of a more complex integrated system than they are. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, in the back. Um, so that one slide where you're describing uh, more conscious, less conscious, you gave the example of human versus like ants or something like that. But yeah. You extrapolate that to like the ocean consciousness theory, you say that the ant and its like external system is like eyes. It can be considered as a higher conscious. Yeah, so so that it potentially could, and, and it depends on IIT still in development, um, but it potentially could. So um, you know, insight like like ants that exist and they all kind of communicate with their pheromones. You could think of that as a more kind of complex integrated system. And I'm not sure about the math of ants in specific um, of what is the maximum of of integrated information, um, but potentially yes. Um, it, it would just kind of depend on the kind of formula that IIT has for um, the amount of information a system integrates and the size of the system and, and all that, but potentially. Uh, in the purple? Uh, in the current like, views around panpsychism, is it more of a structure for the combination problem specifically? Are the current like, leading theories more of structuralist? It is the sum of its parts, or is there any notion that so yeah, so there's this is another part which is in the paper. Is there's two main types of panpsychism. There's reductive panpsychism, which says that the consciousness of something is the um, reducible kind of accumulation of the consciousness of its parts. But there's also emergent panpsychism, which says that yes, everything has some amount of mental experience, but when you combine things, there's some emergent uh, some emergence of conscious experience as well. Um, like of, of the whole, if that makes sense. Um, so it kind of depends on what you, within reductive panpsychism, I think IIT and the maximum of, um, the local maximum of integrated information is the kind of predominant view, but there is emergent panpsychism, which does say that there's some kind of emergence going on. In the blue? How does panpsychism help recognize the function? Yeah, so there isn't exactly a direct link yet, but, but what I'm arguing is, that the kind of physicalist route of studying the brain and the input and output isn't really going to get us to a scientific understanding of consciousness ever. That right, That's what David Chalmers says about the hard problem. And so if we start to think about consciousness as a different way, uh, instead of looking for a certain pattern, uh, instead of looking for a certain pattern of activation in the brain, we think of it as like a fundamental part of the universe. We can kind of create formulas and create laws like IIT that explain how consciousness works. And then if we can understand that, then it's, it's much easier to mechanize, right? Instead of thinking of consciousness as um, an illusion, which doesn't really help us mechanize it. Um, yeah. One more question. In the back. 
Yeah, so potentially. And, and this is where the, the, the math of the local maximum of integrated information comes in, of saying that, um, you know, I think an example that's used is you can think of an individual wave as a, as a, um, a maximum of integrated information. But because it's part of this larger system, which integrates more information being the ocean with all the tides and, and all of that, then we can say that the ocean is conscious. And again, I don't really know the math, uh, which is, is kind of beyond the scope of the presentation. Um, but yeah, uh, something that Tononi does talk about is how if the internet becomes, integrates more and more information, we can eventually reach the point where it integrates more information than the human brain does. And at that point, we kind of become this collective internet conscious. What does that mean? What does that look like? I don't really know. But that is something that he kind of talks about and is uh, a possibility for our future. All right. OK. Uh, hi, everybody. I am Patrick. Um, I am going to be talking about individuation and partition in Kirundi. Um, I should just get out of the way. I am much more of a linguist than a cognitive scientist, but apparently that's part of CogSci. So yeah. Um, so just to get started, um, I'm just going to go over what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to go over some background about terminology and some of the questions that we're interested in, the methodology, and then the results with the analysis and the conclusion. Uh, but before that, just as an introduction to uh, Kirundi, it is a Bantu language, specifically an East Western Lakes Bantu language. It's spoken in Burundi. Um, it's part of the Niger-Congo language family, and it's recognized as an official language in Burundi, but it's spoken in many other countries. So if you don't know where Burundi is, it's a small landlocked nation right there in the Great Lakes uh, region, just south of Rwanda. It has over 11 million speakers worldwide, um, and it's spoken primarily by the Hutu ethnic group, followed by the Tutsi and Twa. Uh, now I'm just going to go over some background. First of all, the count mass distinction. So this is something that's pretty intuitive. If you just take a look at some of the, these are actually backwards. Dog, hand, tree, those are count. Sand, water, wood, those are mass. Um, but I think everybody can get an intuitive sense that there's a difference there. Um, but then there's also some uh, more semantic and syntactic features that we can actually use to establish a more clear difference. So for mass nouns, generally it's the case that they denote substances. Uh, they cannot easily be counted, and they have cumulative reference. And that's just a fancy way of saying that water plus water is still water, whereas dog plus dog is not dog, it's dogs. Um, count nouns, they describe objects or things. They have counting units, and they are non-cumulative. Now for some syntactic features. Uh, some of the more basic ways to distinguish them. In a language that has plurals, it will generally be the case that count nouns combine freely with uh, plurals, whereas mass nouns cannot. So we can say, I saw dogs at the beach. We can't really say I saw sands at the beach. Um, English is also sensitive to the count mass distinction in the quantifier system. So I saw many dogs at the beach works. I saw much dogs at the beach does not. Uh, we see that many and much select for count and mass now. Numerals. Uh, so we can freely combine numerals with count nouns. Well, not the case in mass nouns. And this is something that we don't really have in English, but in a numeral classifier system, the classifier selection will be sensitive to the count math distinction. Um, so you will have to use different classifiers for each uh, type of noun. Now talking about individuation. So we can talk about individuation as being uh, the process of singling out a countable unit from a noun's denotation. And essentially what that means is that you're just taking an abs abstract description and you're taking one thing uh, as a unit that you can count. So Grimm actually argues that individuation is a scalar process and it's not just a binary distinction, but it happens somewhere along a spectrum. And Mufwene argues that the basic distinction in Bantu is not between singular and plural, but singular and non-singular, which 
doesn't sound that informative, but it makes some interesting predictions. So we can group it up like this. Uh, both singular and plural would be considered individuated, while plural and non-individuated, or mass, would be non-singular. So the prediction that this makes is essentially that plural and mass nouns should pattern together in Bantu languages, while singular should be distinct. Um, and then just to give a brief overview of the noun class system in Bantu languages, they are known for their uh, complex noun class system. It's essentially the same as grammatical gender, if you're familiar with that in any Romance languages, except the amount of genders would be around 20, depending on how you count. Uh, but so we can generally look at it and say that the even class uh, prefixes describe or denote singular and the or sorry, odd class prefixes are singular. The even class prefixes are sing are plural or non-singular. Now, just to look at some of the research questions. So I wanted to figure out how is the count mass distinction expressed in Kirundi, and is there a distinction in Kirundi? Um, is that distinction related to the process of individuation? And which one is a more basic process? Uh, I think that we have a tendency to sort of think that Singular is more basic than plural, uh, since singular is unmarked in English, and that's not the case for plurals. But there is some research that would suggest that singular uh, actually takes a lot more processing effort than plurals or non-individuated. So to look at this, I wanted to look at classifier construction, which is a particular type of grammatical construction that takes a countable unit and expresses it overtly. So an example would be there are three piles of wood in Kirundi, Harii Birundo, Vitasu, Vitasi. So we have a head noun that indicates the unit of counting. So in this case, we have piles. And then there's a modifying noun that indicates the substance uh, that would be wood. And then a connective morpheme that links the two concepts. So in English, it would be of. Um, and crucially, we can. We can assume that what's actually happening here is that we're quantifying the wood instead of the pile. Um, so for example, if you say I drank three glasses of water, you're not saying I drank three glasses that happen to have water in them. You're saying how much you drank in terms of glasses. Um, and we can also distinguish between two types of classifier construction. So container phrases are probably the most basic type. That's just quantifying a substance. Uh, then we have partitive or pseudo-partitive construction. So pseudo-partitive construction would be something like a piece of cake where you're quantifying over a denotation using a uh, partition. And then a true partitive would be something like a piece of the cake. Um, whereas instead of quantifying a denotation, you're describing a part of an entity. So the methodology involves uh, targeted elicitation sessions with a native speaker of Kirindi. Uh, so what that would consist of is essentially going over context um, and describing or making contexts that are designed to elicit individuating context and container phrases. Uh, and then we would show them uh, test sentences, ask for their judgment and their interpretation, and whether or not it would be acceptable in those contexts just to go over some of the results now. So looking first at partitive constructions with count nouns, uh, it is generally the case that count nouns in partitive constructions appear with their non-singular prefixes. And in that case, they get pseudo-partitive interpretations. So you're quantifying a denotation. Um, so an example that we have is ibihimba, vienshi, bibihoki. So many pieces of banana. Um, you can actually combine singular prefixed uh, modifying nouns with partitive construction. And when that happens, you actually force a true partitive interpretation. So igipande kimoe chigitunguru is one piece of the onion. So you're no longer just describing how much onion you have. You're saying that there is a piece of a specific onion. Now with math nouns, we see that you can actually use both singular or non-singular prefixes. And in both cases, you get a pseudo-partitive interpretation. So no matter what, you're always getting uh, a quantificational read. So ibihimba bitatu bimikate, 
with the non-singular prefix is three pieces of bread. Ibihimba bitatu yumukate with the singular prefix is also three pieces of bread. One distinction is that in 12a with the non-singular prefix, you are expressing that it would consist of uh, several different types of bread. Um, whereas 12b with the singular prefix is a bit more ambiguous with that. Looking at container construction, uh, we see that count nouns are only allowed in container construction when they appear with their non-singular prefixes. So a grammatical container uh, construction is seen in 13b. Filippo afise isaho imwe yibigori. So Filippo has one bag of corn. Um, 13a is ungrammatical. It uses corn with the singular prefix. Uh, it's worth noting that corn patterns as a count noun in Kirindi, uh, whereas it's not the case in English, but it's referring to a specific ear or cob of corn. With mass nouns, uh, they generally appear with their singular prefixes, but they are also allowed to take both singular and non-singular prefixes. So, um, 14a, ibirahuri, bibiri, bichai, two glasses of wine. And 14b, ibirahuri, bibiri, bichai, and two glasses of different types of wine. So we get the same type of pattern that we saw with the partitive construction, where use of the non-singular prefix with the mass noun uh, expresses multiple different varieties. Just to go over some of the conclusions. So we see that mass and count nouns have different properties in part of constructions and container constructions. But crucially, what we find is that the non-singular count nouns and the singular mass nouns actually pattern together. So if we go back to Grimm's proposed scale of individuation, what that suggests to us is that the non-singular count nouns and the singular mass nouns are actually at a similar point on that scale of individuation. It, so yeah. Um, and that is basically it for that. And then just the takeaway message is that the distinction between objects and substances and mass and count nouns is very crucial to processing and using uh, language and communicating effectively in Kirindi. So I think that that's everything. These are my references. Uh, thanks for listening. And I just want to say thank you to uh, our Fantastic uh, Kirundi consultant Albert for all of his help, and Professor Suzy Lima for supervising the project. Hmm? Yes, yes. Um, we'll be taking questions for the next five minutes. So please raise your hand. Um, okay. We can just talk. <laughs> yes. Um, what was the if there is a count and mass distinction? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's just, that's more just because uh, you probably don't want to go in and assume that just because English, for example, has a count mass distinction that Kirindi does. Um, in a lot of languages, it's expressed differently, but there are some languages that don't seem to really make a difference between count and mass nouns. So we want to actually do proper tests to see if count and mass nouns pattern differently in the grammar. Um, and the language actually makes a meaningful distinction between them, and it's not just a uh, implicature, essentially, if that makes sense. Are there any continuation of distinguishing math and countdowns with other languages, or maybe more with the language community? It would, when you say continuation. Like, is there like any additional steps of like, um, if you want more about count and mass nouns, I would refer you to Professor Susie Lima. Um, but yeah, so uh, part of her work is actually establishing it, um, research on underdeveloped uh, or understudied languages with regards to the count mass distinction. But there is a proposed typology of um, 
ways that languages divide up count and mass nouns. Uh, if you look at uh, Kyrkia 2010, he essentially proposes that there's three different types of languages with regards to the count mass distinction. We have languages like English that make a clear distinction with plurals and uh, numerals. Um, and then you have uh, numeral classifier languages like Mandarin, for example, where it's uh, it's argued that every noun is mass, and then you use the classifier to individuate it. There's also a lot of arguments against that. Um, and then there's number neutral languages, which essentially all nouns are able to combine with numerals, um, and there is no plural morphology or classifier system. But you still do see some differences uh, in count and math nouns. Oh, yeah. In that third type of language, when you do attach a numeral to something that is only the most substance, do they have like a default units that they use to count them, or how do you interpret them? So that is actually, that's a critical part is um, distinguishing whether you're actually combining the numeral with a count or, or with a math noun or if it is coercion. Um, so coercion would be the process of deriving a count noun from a math noun. But in that case, it will only happen when you have um, a normal unit of uh, measurement. So it has to be something that's like very established and regular within a certain context. Like, for example, I can uh, say that I drank two coffees this morning, um, but that only works because it's established that when I say coffee in a count uh, noun context, I'm referring to a single unit of coffee, which we've essentially agreed upon is a cup. Um, if you were to say I drank two coffees and you mean two one liter bottles of coffee, that's probably not going to be accepted. Um, but there are some languages that just allow you to combine numerals with math nouns, uh, irregardless of what it is. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Murad. I'm a second year student in the Cognitive Science program. And I, my area of interest is in altered states of consciousness and mystical experiences. <laughs> So, I'd like to start us off with a quote misattributed to Albert Einstein, but we'll go with it. This quote says that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness from which it is created. The purpose of what I'm going to be talking to you about today is threefold. First, I'd like to dive into the nature of insight. If you've taken COG 250, the idea of insight has been hammered into your brain. Second, I'd like to talk about the dynamic relationships between altered states of consciousness and regular waking consciousness. Finally, I'd like to look at the invariant features of altered states of consciousness that cause insight when solving a problem. So what is insight problem solving? Again, for the people who have taken 250, I'm gonna make this short. Insight, is essentially the aha or eureka moment in problem solving. There are four relevant features in reaching an insight moment. There's the salience of the clues. This is most notably noticed in the problem formulation. There are the external hints, usually done in experimental conditions. There is the practical knowledge, which we can consider relevant to memory. And there are heuristics. There are quite a few heuristics. The one I want to focus on is the notice invariance heuristics, which is the idea that in your different problem formulations that do not solve your problem, what is the essential feature that does not change that needs to be examined more closely? So what is an altered state? It's tough to define because we rarely know what consciousness is. But we can think of an altered state as any state that differs from regular waking consciousness. Assuming today none of you took illicit substances here, you are in a regular state of waking consciousness. If you are sleep deprived, we can consider that an altered state. If you are fasting, that is an altered state. 
If you're dreaming, this is also an ultimate thing. When we talk about the dimensions of consciousness, in particular as they relate to altered states, there are four particular dimensions that seem to really matter. Activation, meaning how readily are you responding to your environment? Awareness, meaning what are you focusing on? Are you looking at the bigger picture or focusing on smaller details? There's the self-awareness, meaning is your sense of self present or absent in the altered state? And finally, the sensory dynamics. Is everything you're experiencing, the stimuli, is it heightened or diminished? Previous research on psychedelics has shown promising results in terms of insight. Ayahuasca has been shown to increase the number of highly original solutions. LSD boosts the number of novel connections between information. But we don't know a lot about the nature and whether or not this insight is true or not. What's really causing it? I'd like to propose a model originally brought up by Carhart, Harris, and Friston in 2019. This work has been going on for about the last 10 years or so. And it's called the Relaxed Be Beliefs Under Psychedelics Model. Essentially, in regular waking consciousness, the mind uses predictive errors, predictive models to avoid prediction error. We can think of this as being evolutionary advantageous to our survival. Being able to determine what's relevant in your environment helps you to know whether or not you're going to die. When under psychedelics, it appears that the domain knowledge, which is your memory of what's relevant, seems to be altered, thus changing the salient clues of your model. So what is learned from psychedelics? This has been research done by Elkin Yaden and Campo, both in the last year, so quite prominent. We see an increase in bottom-up processing, which typically is overshadowed by top-down gestalt processing. What that means is when we tend to look at the bigger picture, under psychedelics, we notice more features. What hasn't changed? Psychedelics has also shown us, and this was very common under the sort of 70s hippie revolution of psychedelics, that people believed they were gaining new information coming from some external source. But what we know is relevant is the connection between the information you already possessed. Again, relating back to memory. And psychedelics dimensionally have an aroused state of awareness, or pardon, an aroused state of, I'm forgetting, <laughs> a wide or narrow awareness. Self-awareness seems to be absent, meaning your sense of self tends to be dissolved. This is what's known as ego dissolution. And finally, your sensory dynamics are increased. People report under psychedelics that every little stimuli seems to be much more valuable than it really is. So we have these four activation. That was the state. <laughs> we have these four dimensions, and we know that responsiveness, grant, um, awareness, and sensory dynamics are all present in the positive dimension, and that awareness and self-awareness are present in the negative dimension. What does that say about the states that we haven't looked at? Does that mean that all altered states only produce insight when the activated states already looked at are the case or not? To do that, I'd, look to, I'd like to look at another altered state, meditation. Meditation is most commonly used to determine or to work through sense of perception and attention. The nature of attention, we know that in regular waking consciousness, the mind is selective and biased to cut through noise stimuli. We cannot respond to every stimuli in our environment. 
If our selection is flawed, this is what happens when we reach an impasse in a problem formulation and cannot reach a problem solution. To do so, I'd like to propose the Laukunen and Slachter inference model of altered states, which essentially says that our awareness needs to move from what's called active inference, where we confirm our selection model, to perceptual inference, meaning revising the selection model. So can meditation cause this shift in inference model? The short answer is yes. In deconstructive meditation, which is not the only type, our predictive model is removed because we enter after lots of meditation, what's known as the pure awareness event. This has been referred to by Metzinger as a minimally phenomenal experience. This causes a shift in awareness, moving through our perception to aware of our perception. A great example of this is the glasses metaphor. Right now, I'm looking through my glasses that is looking through my perception. And as I take them off, I can no longer see any of you. And I'm looking at my glasses, which is my device of perception. And I'm looking and making claims about the effectiveness of this device. This makes us question our paradigm. Again, the paradigm can simply be referred to as the perception device. If we question our paradigm and can reformulate effectively, insight can be reached. So, does meditation fill in the gaps of psychedelic altered states? Yes. Different types of meditation can produce different types of dimensionalities, meaning that across the four dimensions, you can have both positive and negative activation. Before making any claims, I'd like to look at one more altered state, which is dream in sleep. This is to be distinct from daydreaming and hypnagogic states, which is the sort of dreaming that occurs right as you're about to fall asleep. It occurs every night, given enough sleep, which as U of T students, most of us do not get. Even if one forgets their dreams, a lot of people say, oh, I don't, I don't dream at all. That's not really the case. What's happening is that you simply do not remember your dreams. Insight has been found during waking consciousness, and it seems to be a product of sleep or dream in sleep. So, advancements of our understanding of dream insight. In 2003, White and Tetro pro proposed that thought insight was a product of dream incubation, meaning simply that you were moving away from trying to solve the problem and letting it incubate for a while. This was overturned in 2009, knowing that REM sleep, dreaming in REM sleep, caused us to assimilate unused knowledge. This is the connection between different memories that's relevant. In 2015, we had the consolidation of different types of knowledge. This is perspectival, procedural, and participatory knowing. And in 2018, new knowledge frameworks, it was shown that new knowledge frameworks were formed in sleep. These are the, di the dimensions that are relevant in sleep. And we can see that they are quite distinct from both meditation and from psychedelics. What have we learned? The dimensional aspects of insight, we are not restricted to one altered state, meaning that insight is a product of all types of altered states. The dimensions are not what's relevant, but rather the switch, the switch, it's just closed on here, but I just wanna make sure it's still working. Yeah, yeah. okay. So yes, yeah. what's occurring is a switch in the, or a shift from the functional fixedness that occurs in regular waking consciousness. What this tells us is that our mind is more powerful than it, than we take it to be. Altered states do not have to produce insight. Rather, if we learn to control our mind, 
we can produce it in regular waking consciousness. Again, this just shows that what's relevant is the switch between dimensions rather than any dimension in and of itself. There is one caveat to this, which is the dynamic self objection, the presence or absence of self in an altered state. People have proposed that in an altered state, due to the lack of self-awareness, we do not know how the relevant information matters to us. I believe that this is not an objection that holds very firmly as a deep part of what makes altered states so valuable is our relation to regular waking consciousness. If we were to be in an altered state all the time, we would essentially have psychosis. Therefore, what's valuable in altered states is returning back to regular waking consciousness. I'd like to leave you with a poem by Emily Dickinson. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yes. Right. Right. So false insight is very common in psychedelics. And a lot of the people who are opposed to using psychedelics for research into insight, they particularly for that claim that false insight is often reached more often than not, actually. But what seems to be more and more valid is that as we move from the altered state back into regular waking consciousness, we can determine where the sense of self was actually present and who was the self-observer in the state. Any other questions? Yes. That was really good, thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering just if you've come across any recent work on this psychedelic literature of how it's, so we talked about altered states and their help, their help in this story, right, and everything. What about you know, moving from altered states to cuddly altered traits or anything like that? Um, is there any kind of, you know, is there any well-established empirical work that kind of tells us, here's how to do it, here's how not? Yes, so there is some research into what's known as minimally altered states of consciousness. And what, what we've learned from this is that both consciousness and altered states do not fall into a yes or no category, rather that it's dynamical in nature and falls along a spectrum. Again, an altered state under psychedelics is much different than a sleep-deprived altered state. Research into how to do it effectively is still in the works. It doesn't appear that we know how to successfully cause insight yet, but that it's promising in nature. Any other? Yes. What are these deep connections between what I needed to shift in the control and some of the negative aspects of the of that where Could you repeat that again? Yeah. So. I'm curious about how this model applies to bad tricks. Like, can we use to explain what has been going on there and so on? Not particularly. First, because the occurrence of bad trips is quite rare. Again, I'm not suggesting to anyone after listening to this to go and take psilocybin, <laughs> but they do occur. And it's, I believe, one in 100 almost, like about 1% of trips and negatively. And this can be greatly reduced given the proper priming for the experience. Insight in and of itself does not seem to have a reciprocal relationship in showing what causes negative or bad trips. 
but that work is still in development. Yeah. And it relates to one of your slides where you talked about like how to like save our increasing entropy in yes. the dynamic system of the church to think of one of the first slides. Yes. Um like it's also the uh, it was also in concert to learn about that uh, and how um, increased entropy at one point was frame a very thing in frame mating. And only if the frame mating is like leading to a solution and like a positive insight, I feel maybe that church there's like a theory, maybe it leads to a like an like even less appropriate frame uh, after the entropy increase that leads to the bad trip. And it's like because of that, it's really, really hard to integrate that into the self model when we leave the state of the state with like one of the two theory. Yeah, that was put beautifully. Any other questions? Alrighty, thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Amina, and today I'm presenting a study that I'm working with Patricia Ganea and Richard Gorglu, and it's about how do young children interpret conditionals. So before we begin with an actual study, let's get a little bit into the background. So what are the conditionals? So conditional are sentences that talk about a possible scenario that may or may not be actual and describe what is the case in that scenario. So usually conditionals connect two propositions together using an if-then uh, connective, as if in sentence, if it rains, then the roads will get wet. The first part uh, in the sentence, if it rains, is an antecedent, while the second part, the roads will get wet, is a consequent. So it is believed that uh, conditionals are interpreted according to the truth table. So uh, here is the truth table presented, and as you can see, the conditional is false only in one case when the uh, antecedent is true, while the consequent is false. So let's get into one by one over each interpretation. So the conditional is true when both antecedent and consequent, so P and Q, are true, as such when it does rain and the road does get wet. So this interpretation is considered as conjunctive interpretation. The conditional is also true when the antecedent is false and the consequent is false as well. As such, it does not rain and the road does not get well. Both of these interpretations together combined uh, construct a biconditional interpretation. Lastly, the condition is also true when the antecedent is false while the consequent is true. So as such, it does not rain, but the road still gets wet. For any possible reason, one of them, maybe the fire hydrant got broken. So despite the uh, truth table, people don't usually think according to it. And instead, they very often interpret conditionals as biconditionals. The con and so the conditional interpretation pretty often gets forgotten. So why does it happen? There are a lot of theories about why uh, this equivalence and why people reason in this way, why is it happening? Here I will be presenting two possible theories. Uh, those are proponent theories and at the same time they also give developmental predictions that we are looking for. So one of the theories is the mental model theory which states that relations between objects and events are represented in the mind by iconic models or possibilities. The reasoner will initially construct only the conjunctive interpretation and then it fleshes out the rest of the model only if the antecedent is not satisfied. However, this process of fleshing out the model requires working memory processing. And it does take a cognitive load. Another theory is a natural logic theory, which says that the meaning of logical particles in natural language, including if then, is not based on truth conditions, but how people reason about them in everyday conversation. As such, the biconditional interpretation of conditional statement is an invited uh, inference, or in other words, is an implicature. And people have a strong bias toward this biconditional interpretation. However, when this invited inference is overruled and the biconditional fades away, people should respond correctly to all kinds of practices. So what does it say about our children? 
So according to mental model theory, since we know that children have some limitations in attentional control and cognitive load, children more so than adults should have problems representing multiple possibilities due to this cognitive limitation. The natural logic theory says that children more than adults interpret conditionals as biconditionals, not because of within like inner cognitive factors, but just because they abandon ordinary conversational comprehension strategies. So both of these theories give the same prediction. As such, the conjunctive interpretation should be better than the biconditional interpretation followed by the conditional interpretation. So what do we already know about conditional? Uh, the, the development of picture is pretty unclear. Because first of all, not that many studies have been conducted on younger individuals, and more so the results of the studies that do exist are very inconsistent. What we do know is that some studies have shown that children should be able to interpret conjunctions at the age of four. However, there are some studies that also say that children are only capable of conjunctive interpretations at the age of eight. The picture gets even more confusing with biconditional, where most of the studies agree that the biconditional interpretation should arise between the age of 10 to 12. However, some studies show that children are capable of interpreting biconditional at the age of four or five. With conditionals, it's still pretty confusing. Most of the studies agree that conditional interpretation should arise in adolescence. However, as we can see from lots of studies, mistakes still exist even in adulthood. So what are we trying to investigate in our study? First, one question that we were interested in, how do young children interpret conditionals? And specifically, at what age do different interpretations arise? And in order to see that, we, uh, we used a large age range that will allow us to investigate the exact age at which children acquire each type of interpretation. We also were interested in why do adults frequently fail to show conditional reasoning according to Tooth Table? And is it actually that surprising that if adults fail, children will fail as well? To help with that, we used a simpler paradigm that could be used to investigate conditional interpretation in both adults, but also in very young children. So for the first experiment, we uh, conducted the study on three, four, five, six-year-olds as well as an adult. So for that experiment, children and adults, all participants, were presented with a novel toy with a simple casual structure. And they were told that the toy lights up when you put the right toy in it. They were also presented with a tricky puppet that delivers a conditional statement. Sally observes the functioning of a light bulb from behind the curtain and provides a hint based on what she saw. So here's the example of what uh, participants were told. Sometimes Sally will not tell us exactly what she saw, but she will give us a clue. She always tells the truth, but she will not make it easy for us. We have to guess. So here's the example of one of the trials. As you can see, participants were presented with a picture of a light box and two toys. Then the curtains fall. And then they're presented with two pictures. So here it will be, uh, they also hear an audio of this uh, conditional statement. Here it will be, if you put the turtle on the box, then the box will light up. And we have to choose which picture is true and which picture is false. It's a fourth choice task, so they have to say whether it's a top picture or the bottom picture that is true. And uh, we uh, based those trials according to the choose table. As such, we had the conjunctive interpretation where the turtle is indeed on the box and the box is, does light up. We also have the biconditional interpretation when instead of a toy, uh, instead of a turtle, we have a duck. So the turtle is not on the box and the box does not light up. And we also had a conditional interpretation where now we had a duck on the box, but the box does indeed light up. And those are examples of three within subject conditions. And as you can see, there is always a true picture and a false picture. And here are the predictions that we made. Uh, based on what we saw in the previous studies, we expected that conjunctions should be easier than by conditionals, and they should be followed by conditionals, as such conditionals should be the hardest one. So here you can see the results from the first experiment. 
as you can see, adults were capable of uh, inter interpreting all three types of conditionals. However, even six-year-olds do not show uh, the mature comprehension of conditionals, and they only capable of conjunctive interpretation. What is also interesting is that numerical trends show that conditionals were actually better than biconditionals. So to summarize that, uh, adults were successful in all three interpretations. Six-year-olds only demonstrate the conjunctive interpretation, and children were more successful at conditionals. Then we decided to extend the study to seven to 10 year olds. We used the same materials and procedure as in experiment one and just extended the age range. And what we can see from the results is that we only see the mature comprehension of conditionals for nine year olds. And we only see the conditional interpretation for eight year olds. To summarize that, before age eight, children demonstrate a strong understanding only of conjunctive interpretation. Nine and 10 year olds demonstrated a solid grasp of both the biconditional and conditional interpretation. However, what was interesting is that we saw a very inconsistent performance pattern among the children. They were more successful with conditional than biconditional, and also simultaneous success with, we saw the simultaneous success with the biconditional and conditional interpretation. So what can we conclude from all of this? We do see the evidence for mature understanding of conditionals at age of nine, which is earlier than was previously thought. However, the development of conditional meaning is still pretty protracted. Until age eight, children showed a robust comprehension of only the conjunctive interpretation, but nine and 10 year olds showed a robust comprehension of biconditionals and conditionals altogether. Uh, children's difficulties with some interpretation might not be due to a general inability to construct different models, but probably task specific. Uh, how do we know that? Since students show some irregular performance patterns. So that's it. I want to say thank you to everyone who helped me with this study. And this work was supported by funds from Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Thank you so much. Five minutes Q&A, and questions, you may raise your hand. Okay, questions, raise your hand. Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask about, I'll take a little bit of and this kind of research falls into the kind of cognitive uh, science whole, and how we can kind of get from these kind of experimental studies to kind of larger conclusions about Language. So uh, basically, what we are interested in is that whether, the, like, from the point of cognitive science, is whether there are some cognitive limitations. So, if this like protractions in development are due to some attention deficit, or maybe the lack of focus, or something else, or maybe inability to hold this amount of information in the memory altogether. Because otherwise, if it's just a pragmatic factor, then we shouldn't see those problems and we shouldn't see those protracted development. And basically, just generally, like, it's really hard to study adults if you don't know how it developed from the childhood. Um, questions? Yeah. yeah. That was really good. Um, it's really nice to find a very specific thing. But you're finding that at the age of eight and nine, it's really transition. So I guess my question is, what else is happening in child development at that time that might explain this conditional understanding of transition? I'm sure you expected there was enough time. Uh, one of our understandings that could be the possibility of why we see those like kind of weird patterns in performance is uh, that children just could not evaluate the truth and they couldn't actually understand what they had to do. So for example, if you take a look at the, like here in the picture, uh, in, they, instead of evaluating which, uh, which picture is actually true and which picture is actually false, children could actually just simply follow the lit up box, which would explain, for example, why conditionals were actually better than biconditional. Or for example, in other scenarios, they could have followed the turtle. 
in the here the turtle as in, a, in, in an example. We do understand the limitation of this study, so now we're working on a different study that would try to balance it out, but it is a possibility that at that age, children are still incapable of fully evaluating the truth. Uh, yes? Yeah, in the bottom row of the truth table, I mean, if, I'm guessing it wasn't studied because it's a logical policy, you can't have not like, TNQ and then not have TM and get Q randomly, yeah. but I wonder if, if you would think that if this study were to be redone, if there would be any value in discovering if adults um, or children um, could actually figure out themselves or point out that it is a logical policy. Do you think that that would have any usefulness? Um, basically, in this design that we have here, uh, we didn't aim to check that, but for example, the study that we are working on right now is more focused on inferences. So if you're familiar, modus ponens, modus tollens, uh, deny of antecedent, accept the consequent. So in those studies, we will, uh, we will see if people actually are capable, like, uh, if people still do make those fallacies, uh, based on the inferences. But, uh, no, not in this study. In this study, that wasn't the goal. Uh, any other questions? Time for one more. Yes. Are there any cognitive benefits of teaching kids conditions uh, earlier than they, uh, than they would naturally learn? So the thing is, is that the production of conditionals is actually observed way earlier. So the understanding, as, as I showed previously, is only observed at the age of four, five, However, children are capable of making those utterances using the if-then connective, even at the age of two and three. So if it is the cognitive limitation, then there's no point in training. And if there is uh, some pragmatic factors, then it's something more general across all individuals, independently of what age they are. Thank you. Great. I would like to thank each and every one of you for making your way to this lecture hall today, because if you actually really, really think about it, that was a super arduous task, right? You had to navigate your way through campus. You had to recruit your sensory motor system to remember how to walk. You had to figure out what to do about every single person that you ran into on your path. And I am willing to bet a lot of money that that required very, very little conscious effort on your part. And that's despite the massive amount of sensory noise that was thrown at you. And I'm not talking about sound, per se, when I say that. I'm talking about unexpected events. And we do that by taking our previous experiences of being in situations like this and trying to make predictions about what might happen to us. We're relying on things like past memories or social etiquette. And to do that, we need a cognitive system that isn't something like this. Our brain just sitting there waiting for information to flow into it and then doing something about it. What we now know is that the brain and the nervous system are continuously predicting what is likely to happen to us. The only time we ever really use sensory information is either to confirm that our predictions are, to, are correct or to negate them. If we confirm that they're correct, nothing needs to happen. We have a good, solid model of the world that we can rely on. But if we find our predictions are wrong, that's when we send sensory signals up towards our higher levels of cognition to evaluate the discrepancy or the error between our predictions and what actually happened, and then update our model about the world to minimize that error. That's what we call the theory of predictive processing. It's relatively new, but it still has this massive amount of theoretical weight because it's hypothesizing that every single one of our brain processes are conforming to prediction error minimization. So it's this big, grand, unified theory of perception and action and cognition. If predictive processing is as revolutionary as that sounds, we'd better hope that our externalist accounts of cognitive science and predictive processing can somehow find a way to coexist with each other. There's some out there that think predictive processing is a threat to that, some think predictive processing implies that, but there's very, very little discussion on extended cognition and predictive processing specifically. So before we can even begin to accept that cognition might be able to extend, I think that we need a solid explanation for how predictive processing might extend. So extended cognition as a theory has been met with significantly more opposition than that. 
And it is, of course, Andy Clark and David Chalmers, very, very famous thesis that attempted to define the boundary between the mind and its external environment. They wanted to ask the question, where does our mind stop and where does everything else, where does the rest of the world begin? They didn't believe that it stops at the brain and they also didn't believe that it stops at the physical body. They believed that just because an object is external to the mind or body, that shouldn't prevent us from considering it part of a cognitive process so long as it's serving a function that's analogous to a process that we're already considering to be cognitive. <clears throat> so consider, for example, a patient that has Alzheimer's disease and is using a journal to record details that they would otherwise forget. In that example, you're outsourcing your cognitive work to the journal, which isn't doing anything that different, arguably, than our memory system, which we would definitely accept as cognitive already. So today, my goal, is to convince you that predictive processes can extend into the environment. They're not bound to the mind or body. I'll do this in three parts. I'll first demonstrate how active inference, which is an idea super central to predictive processing, can extend. I'll do the same thing for self-evidencing. And then to tie it all up, I will invoke Clark's pluralist argument of predictive processing. So beginning with extended active inference, I've already told you about one way that we minimize uncertainty within our world which is perceptual inference, or updating our prior beliefs about the world when we're provided with some new information. There's a second way too, which is called active inference, which is taking action to revise the world to better match our predictions about it. So for instance, let's say that I have the desire to drink a glass of water. This desire might actually be best represented by me generating a hypothesis that I'm drinking water and then acting to make it the case that I am drinking water, as in grabbing a glass of water and drinking it, to minimize prediction error. On a much, much bigger scale than that, it's been argued within anthropological circles that we will construct a model of the world that maximizes our fitness within a cognitive niche. So to ground that example a little bit, let's consider the history of ancient spicing traditions. So for years and years, knowing your way around spices has allowed for food security and healthcare but it also requires you to navigate this massive network of complex relationships between species and agents and pathogens. It would be impossible to generate all of this knowledge yourself, right? Like imagine how long it would take to gain an understanding of spices if each generation had to discover everything on their own. So instead, we're outsourcing this cognitive work to the niche through active inference in a sense. The environment is almost taught to what action should be expected through signals that are left behind by organisms that came prior. This allows the agent to now make predictions about itself and others. The niche and the agent are mutually predictable. So together, the niche and the agent are producing a shared, very extended generative model that optimizes adaptive behavior and cognitive function. Moving on to extended self-evidencing. So for those of you that are familiar with computational cognition, you'll know about the Markov blanket intuition, which I actually think does a very, very nice job of tying predictive processing in with externalism. This is a Markov probability distribution. The circles are what we call events. The arrows show us what has the power to influence the likelihood of a nearby event. Our goal is to draw a blanket or a boundary around some of these events such that everything within the blanket is conditionally independent of everything else. And we want to draw this boundary as tightly as we possibly can. Many will accept this as at least a partial definition of what states are internal or external to a cognitive system. So putting this in terms of the brain, we have our sensory states, those are in green, um, which affect our internal states, but not the other way around. And then we have our active states, which affect our external states, but also not the other way around. So after we as a cognitive agent have been minimizing prediction error for a very, very long time, and we've been gathering more and more sensory evidence about the world, the model's evidence for its own existence will eventually also be maximized as a result. That's what self-evidencing is. That's actually very much an extended property. So to motivate that example a little bit, consider a spider in a spider web. The spider's external state, by pure definition, would be anything causing the spider's sensory state. So let's say a bug that's trapped in the spider web. That would influence its internal states, giving rise to its active state. The web is then extending the spider's sensory observations by allowing it to infer hidden causes from its environment that it otherwise would not be privy to. So we should be drawing the blanket around the spider web. 
by that same logic, any resource that contributes to self-evidencing should be included within the Markov blanket, regardless of whether it's internal or external to the physical boundary of the organism. And I think there's this interesting duality here that allows extended cognition compatibility with some of the more internalist aspects of predictive processing. It can both be true at the same time that we are causally coupled with our environment through sensory and active states, which is a victory for extended cognition, and that internal state processing still remains independent of environmental states, which is a victory for more internalist and cognitivist perspective. Up until this point, I've just argued that active inference and self-evidencing can extend. And obviously the predictive processing framework extends very far beyond just active inference and self-evidencing, but interestingly, that might actually be enough. Clark's pluralist account of predictive processing is that at the correct level of abstraction, which is where we're attempting to identify a system's ultimate unified goal, human cognition is best understood as a predictive processing system, even if some of its processes aren't directly involved in prediction error minimization. So instead, prediction error minimization is serving as the unifier. So it binds together all of the various sub-processes and resources that are involved in problem solving. So therefore, by showing you that active inference and self-evidencing can extend, predictive processing extends just by very simple virtue of parts of the extended cognitive system being involved in prediction error minimization. This idea that predictive processing and extended cognition are compatible strengthens both pieces of the puzzle simultaneously. It's a new way to look at the extended mind for sure, but predictive processing's endorsement of extended cognition also really strengthens the idea that it might be the mark of the cognitive. And that I think is really exciting because it's opening us up to these new possibilities in constructing theoretical bridges between predictive processing and extended cognition and consciousness. Um, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. I remember one of the objections levied against the extended mind with the concept of overextension. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you see that objection also finds perhaps like an overly broad mark of experience. That's a good question. I don't think intuitively that the responses to, I think it was called cognitive bloat, right? Yes. Um, I don't think that the objection or the responses to the objection would differ. Um, I'm not arguing that there's any difference behind the mechanisms that propel extended cognition. Um, I just want to show that predictive processing is capable of cognitive extension so that we don't need to do away with extended cognition as a whole. Yeah. You said that um, in order to prove, or in order to accept that extended co or that cognition can extend, you have to prove that predictive processing can extend, mm -hmm. well, why is that necessary? Why do you have to prove that predictive process can extend for cognition to be able to extend as well? Mm -hmm. It's only necessary if we're accepting, or if we're starting from the position of accepting the predictive processing thesis. Um, and I think that predictive processing comes onto the scene as what I call a grand unified theory. So it's attempting to unify perception, action, and cognition um, in this really, really broad way which has traditionally been very difficult within cognitive science, but I think it's arguably been one of the first frameworks that has at least partially succeeded in that sense. So for good reason, people are very, very excited about predictive processing. Um, and it's received a lot of uptake and excitement in a ton of different fields within cognitive science and outside of it. Um, it has a lot of applications in medicine. Um, it's a new framework for looking at pain, which has received a lot of support. Um, there's applications in artificial intelligence as well. Perhaps like predictive processing is a good framework um, for genuine strong forms of artificial intelligence. So extended cognition hasn't been met with the same support. In my opinion, I think it's typically a very, very hard sell. So I think that if given the choice, a lot of people would prefer to throw extended cognition out the window before they throw predictive processing out the window. So if we're accepting the predictive processing framework, because I think it can be very, very promising, I think it's a good idea to show that extended cognition can hold, um, because I think it's similarly exciting, and I would hate to see that done away with in the favor of predictive processing. 
Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Hapsuna. I'm actually in my last year of undergrad at UTM, so I don't go to the USC campus. But um, I'm here to present my research into cross language transfer in phonological perception and production of L2 English stuff by L1 Somali speakers. I know that's a wordy title, but we'll get into it a bit and all the definitions. Uh, let me start off first with an introduction to the Somali language, if you all are not familiar. So Somali is a Kushtic language. Um, another Kushtic language, for example, is Aroma. Uh, these languages are mostly speaking in the Horn of Africa, so in countries such as Somalia, Djibouti, Kenya, and Ethiopia. So Somali is a really an understudied language in the field of linguistics. Um, it's spoken around by over 15 million people, um, also including the Somali diaspora. For example, my family, um, my parents are native speakers of Somali, and I'm a heritage speaker of Somali. Um, another fact about the Somali language, there is a lot of influence from Arabic, Italian, and English, mostly due to colonialism, as well as language contact and religion. <laughs> Uh, but what I'm going to be focusing on is Somali phonology. So in case no one knows what phonology is, phonology is the study of sound and the sound system used in a language. So for Somali, there's five vowel phonemes, A, E, E, O, and U. And there's also the long versions of those, so A, E, E, U. Um, but I'm specifically focusing on consonant sounds. So Somali has 23 consonant phonemes, which includes voiceless and voice sound. Now, let's explain exactly what voiceless and voice sounds are. So a voiceless and voice sound are related to stop phonemes. So stop phonemes are a type of sound consonants where you breathe in your you breathe in air and the air is temporarily blocked into your vocal tract, then it's released. And this causes a pause and then a loud burst of sound. Um, and soft phonemes are classified into two, voice and voiceless. Um, voice meaning once you say the sound, you can feel your vocal cords, vocal cords vibrating, while voiceless sounds, you don't feel them vibrating. Um, and soft phonemes are also differentiated by their place of articulation. So when you say a sound, you use different parts of your mouth to pronounce the sound, right? So, for example, p and b are examples of stop phonemes. And p and b are both pronounced with your lips. In linguistics, we say the labial place of articulation. But the difference between p and b is that p is a voiceless sound. So if you feel your throat, you don't feel your vocal cords vibrating when you pronounce p. But when you pronounce b, your vocal cords does vibrate, and that's what makes b a voice stop. The fact about Somali language is that Somali doesn't have the voiceless p sound, but it has the voice b sound, which is very strange because usually many languages have the voice and voiceless counterpart, but Somali doesn't have that voiceless counterpart, which is actually one of the most common voiceless stops in all languages. So for example, as you can see, this is the, phono the Somali phonology chart for consonants. As you can see, we have b, but no p. But we have t and d, which are placed, um, which are pronounced at the alveolar place of articulation. Um, it says dental here, but it's alveolar and dental usually. Um, so this we have t and d, and we also have k and g, k voiceless, g voiceless, and they're produced at the velar place of articulation, so way back into your mouth. But as since we have b and we don't have p. It's, there's asymmetry in this consonant system. And that's what I wanted to focus on. So when we measure, also this is a very important thing, in linguistics, when we measure stuff, we use a thing called VLT. Um, VLT is the amount of time between the release of the stop consonant and the onset of voicing. So you breathe in the air, there's a pause, and then you release the sound and it produces a stop. And whether there's voicing and non-voicing, we measure the time between the release of the stop and the beginning of voicing or non-voicing. So a positive or a higher a positive or a higher VOT value indicates a voiceless stop, meaning your voice, your vocal cords are not vibrating, while a negative or a lower VOT 
indicates that the voice stops. So into cross-language transfer. So we now know that Somali has b, but it doesn't have p. So that I what I specifically wanted to research is whether or not L1 interference, meaning your first language, would affect your second language. So for Somali speakers, would the lack of p influence their pronunciation and production of p in English? So exactly. So my research question generally is to investigate whether the asymmetry of the Somali stop system affects the perception and production of L2 English stops by L1 Somali speakers. So does a lack of P affect the pronunciation of English P by L1 Somali speakers with L2 English? So I had some general predictions and hypotheses, which I predict that it would affect that a native Somali speaker would listen to the sound p and perceive it as b. So they would perceive p and b as the same sound. However, they would not perceive t and d as the same sound because both t and d are present in the Somali constant inventory. And I also predicted in terms of production that native Somali speakers would produce b in place of p when elicitating English words. However, English speakers would not because in the native English speakers have p and b in their consonant inventory system. So how would we measure this exactly in terms of VOT? L1 Somali speakers would produce the English p with a lower VOT, meaning they would voice the p than the VOT of the English p produced by native English speakers. So Somali speakers would voice p while English speakers would not voice p. And also, Somali speakers would produce English p with a similar VOT to the VOT of English b and Somali b produced by L1 speakers. A little confusing, but basically, the L1 Somali speakers, when producing the sound p, I believe they would have a similar VOT to when they produce b in English words as well as b in Somali words. So all three of those sounds would be the same to them. So let's move on to methods on exactly how I measured this. So I, this was relatively a small study because it was completed for class. Um, so there was two L1 Somali speakers with L2 English, and there was also two L1 English speakers. So two native Somali speakers and two native English speakers. And for my task, the first task, I had them, the Somali speakers listen to a minimal pair list in English with sounds beginning with p and b. And I wanted them to say whether or not they believe the word, that minimal pair, were the same pair of words or were they a different pair of words. And then I had an English word list task where both Somali speakers and English speakers read a word list with words beginning with initial p and initial b. And I measured the VOT produced by the Somali speakers and produced by the English speakers. And then lastly, to measure the VOT of the Somali b by Somali speakers, I had a picture naming task where I provided a picture to the Somali speakers and they would say the name of the item in the picture. And the items in the picture all had words beginning with b, t, and d. And for measurements, as I mentioned before, I use VOT to measure it, and the software to measure VOT is PRAC. So, for example, here's my task. So, for the listening task, you see B and P are things called minimal pairs, where just the change of one sound changes the entire meaning of the word. And then for, uh, for task two, the P and B minimal pairs, I had the Somali speakers and English speakers read these, and I measured their VOT of the initial B and in all the words beginning with B, and the initial P and in all the words beginning with P. And then for my um, picture naming task, this was only presented to Somali speakers, so I presented them with a picture, for example, with someone with hair, and I would point to the hair, and I would ask them to say the word inside that picture. And for example, the word for hair in Somali is Timo. So they would say that, and then I would measure that initial sound. Um, the sound for Somali, the Somali word for book is book, 
and I would measure that initial sound. Okay, so my preliminary results. So I had my participants do all of these um, tasks, and then I made some general conclusions from it. Not significant conclusions as well because it's a small sample size. But what I saw was that Somali speakers could discriminate between minimal pairs with initial T and D, T and D, so T and D, more accurately than discriminating between P and B. So in simpler terms, when they listened to the sounds that began with P and B, most of the time, they thought of them as the same word. But when they were listening to the sounds that began with T and D, they recognized them as different words. And then I also saw that L1 Somali speakers produce the English P with a lower VOT than how native English speakers were produced the, the, the English P, which is one of my hypotheses. And I also surprisingly noticed that L1 Somali speakers produce the Somali B with a wider range of VOT than the Somali T and D. And we'll get into this more with our graph. Uh, so for our first graph, as you can see, this is um, a box plot. VOT is on the y-axis. And basically, the comparison of the initial B sound and the initial P sound produced um, by L1 Somali speakers. And as you can see, B is lower. They produce B with a lower VOT than P. And this was unexpected to me because if you remember, my general prediction would be that they would pronounce these sounds as the same. So I would expect them to have a similar VOT, but I like to see that it was different than what I imagined. And the initial pull produced by L1 English speakers is what I imagined. So English speakers, since we have pull and pull both in our um, constant inventory, they produced what I expected, both with a lower VOT and pull with a higher VOT. But the most interesting thing is the P by Somali. As you can see, the VOT of P produced by Somali was a much wider range of VOT than I expected. I just expected it to be down low, right next to B. And also, here's the VOT of initial D, T, and B by L1 Somali speakers. Um, another surprising, so T expected. T exists in the Somali consonant inventory, and it's a voiceless stop. So it has a positive high VOT. So T is all the way up there. D has a lower VOT since it's a voice stop, so it's down in the VOT. But B is what's surprising, as I expected it to be down low, right next to D, with a lower VOT. But however, B by L1 Somali speakers, the Somali B had a much wider range of VOT than I expected. And this led me to believe something that I didn't predict in my initial. So basically, listening to the perception task of the Somali speakers identifying P and B as the same sound, as well as producing the Somali B with a wider range of VOT, it led me to believe that possibly P and B in the Somali language could be allophones of the same phoneme. So allophones of the same phoneme and allophone, a phoneme represent is like two distinct sounds. So in English, p and b are two distinct sounds. If, for example, again, like p and b, the change of that sound in the initial word completely changes the meaning of the word. But if it was in English, for example, let's say p and b were allophones of the same phoneme, p and p and b, we would, could say they're the same words, but let's just say one dialect of English pronounces it differently, but the words have the same meaning. So I, may, I, my results kind of made me believe that P and B and Somali could be allophones of the same phoneme B, meaning that Somali speakers could produce B at a higher VOT and a lower VOT, and the word, the meaning of the word would still be the same, but it would just be probably maybe dialectal differences or just individual differences, but it's hard to conclude without a larger sample size and also studying more into it. Um, another conclusion that I saw, a general conclusion, is that I did not 
see um, Somali speakers undergo language interference in um, producing the English p as b as I expected. So if for if we go back to those graphs, um, remember I expected b and p to be at a similar VOT range. However, this did not happen. However, the Somali speakers did undergo language interference and produce the English p as the Somali b. So this p produced by so Ella Somali speakers, I see has a wider range of VOT. I saw that it resembles the the production of b by um the Somali b by uh Somali speakers. So it had the Somali b and the pronunciation of the English p by Somali speakers had a similar VOT, and I was thinking that then it might be like a similar sound to them, basically. Uh, so overall, general conclusions of my studies uh, provided some insights into linguistic interference and negative language transfer in L2 Somali speakers. Uh, I My study was really small with a, a, not a lot of participants. So uh, luckily, I had the opportunity to revise my procedure and carry out my study with more participants. So I'm not sure if this could play, but I'm not sure about the sound. But <laughs> one of the things with my revised procedure is for the perception task, I use a natural word list. So I had them listen to the words B and P produced by an English speaker. Uh. But but what I did now is I actually changed that perception task into a VOT continuum, meaning they're, they're stimuli with English sounding sounds that begin with a P and a B, and these initial sounds are edited by VOT, like their VOT is edited to be longer in the initial sound than to be lower, and I would compare it like that, and I would see if they could recognize the stimuli as different sounds or similar sounds. For example, this, uh, uh, would you think these are the same sound or different sounds? I'll play one more time for you guys. Uh, uh, Does anyone want to guess whether they're the same or different sounds? Different? Yes, they are different sounds. Um, the first one has a VOT. Uh, uh, I believe around 60, um, 30 milliseconds, and the second uh, one has a VOT around uh, 60 milliseconds. So there's around a 30 millisecond difference. And as you can see, I would expect Somali speakers to listen to that sound and not catch the difference. But I would expect an English speaker to catch that difference. So, and that's pretty much it. Um, just my acknowledgments. Thank you to Dr. Justin Shirt and the sounds of UTM lab um, for piloting my revised study and providing some helpful suggestions. Uh, yeah, so now we'll just take a question. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to ask one of the studies in other ones like Eric before. Yes. And I want to ask, have you, have you found your results to be consistent with what they find uh, in the other ones? Um, I believe it is very similar to Arabic because Arabic, I believe, doesn't also have the p sound and it only has the b sound. And one of the things about the Arabic language is that Somali has a lot of loan words from Arabic. So it kind of led me to believe that maybe that the, the absence of the Somali book could be due that to loan words and like Arabic influence. Somali is highly influenced by the Arabic language. Maybe the reason why it doesn't have the p is also due to Arabic. But for my study, uh, I specifically only focused on Somali. That's why I had originally had Arabic loan words in my word list task, and I had to heavily revise and like heavily go over to get rid of all Arabic loan words just to look at Somali. So I don't know exactly for Arabic. Um, yeah. So according to your conclusion, uh, would it be accurate to say that languages that have um, those less phenomes than other languages, like Japanese, which has very little uh, phenomes, compared to uh, Latin Germanic language, which has a lot of them, um, would you say that they, um, 
the people who are born into those uh, little female languages would have a difficulty learning, you know, generally learning those uh, Generally, yes. So basically, L1 interference, since you have less phonemes in your initial L1, your native language, my general hypothesis was that that the fact that you have lesser phonemes and then now learning a, a language with more phonemes could result in L1 interference. So you could be pronouncing a different sound in place of a, a sound that you haven't learned before. Yeah. I was want to uh so what interested me was you watch your sound like you find uh range in the DOC uh yeah. for my speakers like what test I mean the yeah. there's no more sort of distinction. Mm -hmm. So do you know if this wider DOT range is a is common across languages that have one of oil version of phony but not a voice or vice versa? Um I can only specifically say for one more language because I'm currently doing some field with linguistics in it. Um, I did work to see some similarities to aroma because aroma also doesn't have p in its consonant inventory. And I did have um, an aroma speaker pronounce some p and b words, and I did see some similarities where the p had a much larger field range than the b. Um, that's why originally my two participants, one of them uh, was more proficient in English than the other person. So that's why um, I actually revised my study a bit for the eligibility criteria of the L1 Somali participants. Uh, like they had to be born in Somalia. They had to completely not learn English as a child and then only learn English as an adult, basically because I wanted everyone to be kind of like at an equal level. Okay. So um, this is a project that I had the pleasure of working on, uh, along with Sung and um, Elizabeth and Stephanie uh, in 2019. So some of these things are a little uh, the recesses of my memory, but you know, I'm gonna try my best here. So um, this presentation is adapted from an outreach presentation that we sent to our participants after they had done the study. And uh, we looked at spiritual practices amongst online esoteric communities. Uh, one important note is that this is a preliminary exploratory analysis. So um, the goal is not so much to make causal conclusions, but more so to explore what practices are in common use among various online communities and to identify patterns and relationships within the effects these practices may have on their practitioners. And finally, to inform future research. Uh, so first, I'll kind of do a little cognitive science background on spiritual practice in general. Um, spiritual practice is a form of retraining the senses in order to alter one's perception of reality, thereby cultivating a specific psychological or spiritual state. Uh, some of the more mainstream practices include uh, prayer and meditation, um, also yoga, focused reflection, but then there are also some more esoteric or uh, less known, less mainstream um, practices like divination, um, casting spells, making sacrifices, and even topomancy, which is the practice of creating an imaginary friend. Um, so how does cognitive science explain what's going on here? Um, essentially, human beings are narrative creatures all the way down to the level of our perception of reality. Uh, in other words, we construct a story of our reality that has influence on all of our levels of perception. And these narratives are powerful because we don't have a built-in reality sensor. And reality monitoring is a learned skill, and it can be altered by factors like training and culture. So uh, baseline perception of reality can change with three things, um, individual differences, training, and culture. Um, for the individual differences, I'm referencing absorption, which is um, essentially an individual's personal tendency to be engrossed in sensory or imagined events. Uh, and this is 
coming from Tanya Lerman's work. Um, basically, although so Western mainstream science tends to pathologize differences in perception, but in the same way that some people can have better vision or better hearing, some people just have a more rich inner visual experience. And this usually means that they'll be more engrossed in spiritual practice um, because they have, um, they're have they more engrossed in their own sensory experience and they are more capable of conjuring vivid imagined events. Um, training is also a factor. This is where the spiritual practice bit comes in because you can simply learn to use your senses differently. And a lot of spiritual practice in particular is grounded in relearning the senses um, and training attention and imagination. Um, this requires a lot of active participation. Um, and play is actually a big part of training um, because it's, it's, it's make believe until you make belief. I got that from <laughs> Um And then the third is culture. And this is kind of Tanya Lerman's main point is that culture sort of scaffolds um, because it's producing expectancies for what you should and should not be able to perceive. Uh, so this brings us to the background for a particular study. Uh, so the background for this study uh, there is some excellent work on spiritual experiences uh, being conducted in Christianity. It's Tanya Lerman's work is over there. Um, and she was looking at the ways in which cultural and psychological factors interact to shape people's experiences of religion. Um, so for us, um, we wanted to see how this would go sort of on web-based forums, because this is particularly relevant, because the rise of web-based forums like Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook have vastly expanded um, the accessibility of esoteric practices. Uh, so again, we sought out to explore uh, what practices are in common use uh, among various online communities and what effect, effect they may have on practitioners. So now that we've laid out the background, um, so for our method, uh, we recruited 152 participants from Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit, and we asked them details about their spiritual practices. They also completed questionnaires in three domains, um, cognitive, phenomenological, and personal identity. Uh, there's going to be a full list on the next slide that I can show you. And then for the qualitative aspect, um, we sorted the practices into groups based on their common features. And then for the um, quantitative uh, quantitative aspect, then our third author uh, grouped the scales into factors into the factor analysis. We'll get into later. So these are the questionnaire domains. Um, cognitive. Uh, phenomenological and personal identity. Each of these is a separate scale, which means we have a lot of data. Um, yeah, look. Yeah, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, for the sake of time. So for our qual data, um, we found that participants described a wide range of practices, including divination, meditation, casting spells, making sacrifices, yoga, researching new practices, prayer, focused reflection, and constructing tulpas. Um, that was just dumb. There were a lot of things. Uh, and then we essentially sorted them into groups based on uh, the way that people describe their practice. This is like the building block approach. Um, so we use their experience of their practice over historical, cultural, or traditional framing. Um, so these are the groups that we had. Um, perceptual, so manipulation of the senses, particularly through the use of mental imagery. Meditative, clearing or focusing the mind. Devotional, uh, worship or sacrifice to a higher power. Reflective, uh, thinking about knowledge in new ways to find new perspectives on what is already known. Intellectual, seeking new knowledge, particularly about new spiritual practices. And then embodied, manipulation of the body, either in motion or through energy work. Um, so those, are, those were our fall sort of groups. Um, I guess I can leave that for a second. Um, so then the quantitative stuff was done by our lab uh, staff wizard. <laughs> Um, so, but I'll try to do my best to explain. So um, basically, uh, she did a factor analysis and she found that the data from the questionnaire scales fit into three factors, grounding, growth, and porosity. Um, so for grounding, these were the scales uh, related to self-clarity and lack of social anxiety. So this is about social and emotional adjustment. Uh, for growth, these are the scales relating to spirituality and meaning in life. So self-transcendence and meaning is sort of a measure. Um, and then the third is porosity. Uh, these are the scales relating to mystical or hallucinatory experiences, um, and it's about atypical perception. Um, one note is that uh, factor analysis tells us which scales are tightly related, but it doesn't name them. So we came up with the labels themselves. Um, the first two are self-explanatory, but the third we borrowed also from Tanya Lerman's work. Uh, we tried to find a neutral term to describe um, 
atypical perception, um, and we borrow from time to moment. Um, okay, so this is what we got. Um, all right, so the plot shows how engaging in each type of practice relates to participant scores on each of our three factors. So you can see the six groups of practice, and then the factors are on the bottom, grounding, growth, and ferocity. Uh, the blue dot, uh, oh, I, I, you can see the devotional, embodied, imaginal, intellectual, meditative, collective. Uh, the blue dot is having that practice. The green is having any other practice that's not in that group. And then the red is having no practice. Um, this is a lot kind of just to show you all at once. So I'll kind of break down some of our observations in the next slide. Um, so uh, general observation. Um, overall, having a spiritual practice does seem to be a benefit over not having one across all three factors. Um, although, interestingly, meditation didn't seem to affect ferocity, um, but that there's some support for that in other research. Also, um, about the eclectic nature of the assortment of practice, um, we found that pr practitioners in our study drew freely from multiple traditions in their practice and intermixed them. Um, this might be expected from the lived experience of practitioners, but academic research tends to presume cleaner boundaries between traditions and practices than is supported by the evidence here. Um, third observation is that people had varied efforts to justify their practice within the scientific worldview. Actually, younger people were more likely to invoke scientific reasoning to justify why their practice worked for them, while older people less so. One person even appealed to a version of the law of pragmatism, saying, if it works, it's true. So, um, yeah, that was interesting. Um, yeah, uh, future direction. Um, our study was a preliminary exploratory study of spiritual practices in the modern age of the internet, um, where before they've largely been studied either within large formalized religious traditions or as subjects of history rather than current experiences. Um, also, many of the scales currently in use in psychology to assess alters perceptual experiences make some pejorative assumptions about what's good and normal versus bad and abnormal. Um, and so one goal for future work is to create new scales that assess such experiences without making these kinds of judgments. Um, and we hope that this might help with that. Um, future studies will ideally develop a more focused series of measures of the results of spiritual practice and confirm the structure and effects of practice across a wider range of participants, including controlling for levels of experience. Do you think the internet has been a net good or a net bad when it comes to these kinds of practices? Hard to answer. Um, depends on how you use it, right? Um, we saw some dangers of some of these things, right? Um, if you're playing with your own perception and you have no structure and no teacher, uh, sometimes that can not be great. Uh, we did actually find that having like formal training was a good thing for people overall. Um, so there can be dangers of having access to like perceptually modifying uh, techniques. Uh, Jitsung talks about this a lot, but um, good and bad, depending on how you use it, depending on how responsible you are, how much you're reading. Um, yeah. Yeah. Use this. Go for it. Is that a question? No, I'll just... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, so on Reddit, usually if someone is, a lot of the people that were in this were in, did a lot of practices, were in many subreddits, and were kind of involved in various different places. And that seems to be like kind of a feature of the internet, because usually if you're on one subreddit, you have access to other ones. Um, and the, like, the nature of these communities is that there's like a lot of sharing and people have just way more access to things. Um, Jensung has likened it before to like a second printing press, right? Because people just have access to so many more things than they did before. Um, and can kind of sample practices in a way that they haven't been able to do historically. No. Yeah. Based on the preliminary study, what direction would you like to take future research? That's just a question. That <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I, I like the way that, that 
I don't know, there, there's something, okay. From the way that people responded to our study, especially like at first people were really hesitant and they thought that we were trying to like invalidate with their practices and make judgments about them. And I, I think that the way that we did this was we we're trying to be more person forward with like the whole like, I don't know, experience of spiritual practice. And there was a lot of emphasis on um, just kind of studying people's beliefs. And I think that that seems like a better or just a, a more humanistic strategy for this kind of thing. Um, and so if there's a feature, that I would like it to be like that, you know? Yes. Yeah. What do you mean by placebo? Uh, like, because they practice spirituality mm -hmm. based on stuff. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not. So, like, there's a <laughs> What would you say was the Well, I mean, they're having like perceptual experiences because like spiritual practice is you're training your senses to build your reality of the world, right? So, um, in a basic, basic example is belief, right? Like believing in God, you're creating like in prayer, you're working on making a model of something that you're going to believe in. I don't know if you want to call that placebo because it's, it's like a little, I, I don't know. To them, it, it, it's real and it works. And I think that that's what we got from this. Like overall people, we're higher in all three factors, right? Grounding and growth. Like it was working for them, um, and they were believing in it. And I don't think that was the purpose of our study is to identify whether that's like placebo or not. Yeah. A question? Oh, okay. Um, there's a question about the study that you found a substantial difference in data between people who are already actively practicing spiritual um yeah, I'd have to look at the exact numbers again, but I'm pretty sure that yes, there was a, there was a difference. I mean, we that would be a, a further direction, but um, I think from what we did find that the longer people have been doing the practice, the better it was for them. But I, I'm not sure. Of that. Okay. Jenna? Oh, I, I was just going to ask how being a part of the study and being in these kind of esoteric communities changed your game on spiritual practices kind of throughout the time. Yeah. Uh, so for me personally, I don't uh, I don't see a lot of things. I have like a very I'm on the other end of the absorption spectrum. I have very low uh, internal visual imagery. Like I have I have none. So for me, it was really interesting to hear about people's experiences. Um, but I will say, like, not once did I not believe it. Just because I can't experience the same thing, it it really opened up my mind about like the just the I don't know. The, the wealth of human experience, like, it, it, it's so cool that people see these things and, and it helps them cope with life and grow spiritually. That's amazing. You know, it really was inspiring to me to work on. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, 